I knew as soon as we got ready to start, we'd have a couple last minute jump in. Good morning and welcome to the Rotary Club of Carbondale. I think Faith just stepped out. So there's our welcoming bell. And welcome to the Rotary Club of Carbondale and thank you to Faith Miller for being our greeter today. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by Miss Linda Flower. So Linda, if you would unmute yourself and lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Linda. Sierra, are you with us still? Would you like to read your moment of reflection? Hi, I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me. Loud yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, kindness in words creates confidence. Kindness in thinking creates profoundness. And kindness in giving creates love. Thank you, Sierra. Thanks for those great words. Uh, today's, uh, instead of a song, I, I picked a video to remind us uh, of Rotary. talk a little bit about the polio program later in the program so uh, Cindy buys will you unmute yourself and I don't know if you caught all the guests but could you introduce our guest today I did see Deepa and so maybe we can have her introduce herself and then we'll see if there are any other guests hey this is me Deepa and uh, Right now I live in Carbondale and I'm the member of uh, Rotary Club of Carbondale Breakfast and I'm serving as an international service chair. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great to see you. Welcome. Are there other guests joining us today? Or back? Or is our regular Are visitor hello? those days? I'm a permanent. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the sun. Well, thanks for being with us today. And our guest speaker today is Bart. Bart, say hello. We don't want to leave you out. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And we're going to get through just a few club announcements before we get to our club uh, presentation today. Uh, the first thing to talk about is we to, to fill our club duties for greeters, speakers, uh, four-way test. We're going to start doing that using the form of a doodle poll. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with that, when I send out the the club highlights email, inside that is going to be a link that looks similar to these that you see on the screen. It, when you click on the one that's for July 29, it's going to take you to a, a screen that looks similar to the one that's inside this doodle box. All you'll do is type in your name and put a check mark next to any of the duties that you wish to do and then hit send. 
and it's and it's really just that simple. Once the task is full for the week, there's nothing to do. So if you come in and you see all of the tasks are taken, uh, just move to the next set of links for the next week, and maybe there will be a duty open for the following week. So as, as we move forward, that's probably the way we're going to do it, uh, simply because as we, as we discussed last night at the Rotary Board meeting, I think we're going to delay meeting face-to-face. Uh, and not to get into too much of the detail, our guest speaker is going to probably tell us a lot of the reasons why we don't need to be meeting face-to-face -face during, during an uptick in COVID-19 cases in Jackson County. So that's where I'm going to leave it. I'm going to let him talk as to the reasons why we, we are not meeting face-to-face. -face. I don't want to spoiler alert his, his presentation. But once, once it is safe to do so, we'll, we'll start meeting together face-to-face. -face. We'll coordinate it with the club, give you enough time to decide whether you want to come and meet face to face. We will continue to, to present the meetings on Zoom in this format. We'll also do them, record them and put them on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll have to make sure we coordinate it through the school and with Heartland Catering to make sure that everything is the way we need it to be for returning to normal. So as we move forward, uh, we'll keep everybody informed. Uh, couple of the club service projects that are ongoing. The first one is the Cards for Kids project. The cards are due to Cindy by mid-August. Uh, Cindy, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, thanks Shane. Um, some of you know I've been out of town for a couple of weeks, but I'm back and I have received just one email about the cards project, but I'm hoping that many of you are gathering cards or writing out cards. Remember, I have cards I can bring you if you would like me to supply you with cards. I can also come and pick up cards from you if you have cards that you've written out for children in the hospital. Please just send me an email and let me know and I'll be happy to coordinate any assistance that you need. Thanks very much. So if we have cards ready and would you, would you like us to mail them to you? You can, um, you can mail them to me, that's totally fine. But if you wanna save the postage and arrange a pickup, either in Carbondale, or if you want me to come to your home, I'm happy to do that too. Now, if you can see, see my face, I've got a set of cards that have animals on them. I have a set that are Peanuts characters that I'll be filling out and sending to you. So I've got 25 plus cards that'll be ready for you by the end of the week, so. Hopefully, if every Rotarian can send 10 or 20 cards, we can send more than 100 and we'll, we'll touch the lives of many children out there. So thank you, Cindy, for being the lead on that project. Ella Lacey, would you like to give us an update on the t-shirt the side of the masks for Haiti? Yes, I would be happy to. As most of us know, we have um, finished phase one, which was getting 550 masks to Pinyon, Haiti to the hospital beyond Faisal that's there. We finished that. We're now into phase two, which we were waiting for shipping and arrangements related to it. So we are now going to produce step one of phase two, which is getting those masks uh, cut out according to a pattern. They are t-shirt masks and we've asked people to donate t-shirts. We have about a almost 100 on hand, so it's not like we're hurting a lot. We know we can get three out of almost any t-shirt. We may be able to get four out of some, so if we're getting close to 100, if we get 125, 130, we'll be in great shape. So if you will drop the mask, the uh, t-shirts, either at my house or arrange a pickup. I live 847 West Lake Road. They can be put under my carport any time. There are painters doing house painting, so you may be confused when you get there, but it's all okay. We keep that separate. So I will appreciate everybody who can getting a few t-shirts to me. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Ella or Cindy before we go on? Seeing none, hearing none. Uh, a couple other projects that are continuing is our SIH food drive. Cindy, do you have an update on that for us? Sure. Although I was gone the last couple of weeks, another woman from my church did a food delivery to our healthcare workers in my absence, and I will be doing another one next week. 
I'm thinking we're probably going to wrap this project up at the end of the summer with school starting again and my own schedule getting quite busy. But if you still want to make donations in the next few weeks, I'm happy to take them and I'm still delivering food to the local hospitals. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Gail, you wanna give us an update on the two projects with the Carbondale Warming Center? Sure. Um, well, lunch, uh, our, our sponsorship of lunches on Wednesdays uh, for the Warming Center continues while we're um, in adjournment for personal face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Um, I communicated with Carmelita uh, last night and this morning, and she passed along her deep appreciation for everything the club has been doing for the Warming Center. Uh, they can they continue to have need for shelving and fans to get through, uh, help get through the heat mm -hmm. of uh, the next couple of months before they get back into the heating season, warming season. Thanks um, to Ginger, uh, who dropped off a couple of box fans la after last week's meeting, I've delivered those. And Rick arranged for a number of shelving units to be picked up and Shane helped uh, to deliver those, and I delivered some a, a few days ago. So um, there continues to be a need there if you have access to resources. Um, they pr also could use some help with linens. So if you have towels or bedding um, that you might be able to, to share, uh, there is a need for those kinds of items too. I have a question for Gail. The size bedding, does it matter? Um, I'll find out, Faith. Um, could you put your email or, or phone number in the chat and I'll mm -hmm. uh, communicate back to you? I'm guessing uh, twin size, but let me double check with her. Ella Lacey, could you put your address in the chat box for people to see where they can I'm, drop the t-shirts off? Would that be okay? Right now, as we speak. As we speak. Boy, great, great minds think alike, Ella. There Thank you. you. Go. <laughs> so as we move through, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the 100 Little Things project. Uh, 20 projects down. Uh, we've got 24 that are currently underway. Uh, so, you know, we've talked a lot in the last couple of weeks about what we've done, what, we're, what we've got underway, but uh, projects that I want to talk about right now, there's three of them that, that, that we can start organizing now that, that have a little bit of time frame out in front of them. Uh, the first one is the Salvation Army bell ringing process. Uh, I'm looking for someone to champion that project. I'm not sure what the fall will bring, if, if there will be Salvation bell ringers or not. Uh, but we'll need someone to coordinate our actions with a location through the Salvation Army. So if someone is interested for that project, just drop it in the chat box, we'll, and we'll sign you up as the champion for that one. Uh, the second one, it could be a little bit more creative. One of the things we were looking at was someone that would volunteer to read at the local schools to children. Uh, we could get creative and do that in a virtual environment. We could set up a Zoom time to where we're reading and could share that, that Zoom hour with, with local schools. Uh, we could record the sessions and let the schools play in the meantime they want. So I'm looking for someone that could champion that project and give it some, some direction and give it some thought and decide what they want to do with it. So I challenge Rotarian and somebody to take that project on that, that enjoys reading to children. And the last one to talk about is October will be World Polio Day again. Uh, what are we going to do? What's, what's our presentation going to look like? We need someone to champion that project. So uh, start thinking about those three projects. And if you're interested in being a part of the team or leading that effort, let me know. Any questions on those? Seeing none, I'm going to move on. Uh, club donations for the month to Ginger, I think Ginger's with us. You're up in July, so I think Ginger, we changed it to $500 this month, so thank you for donating $500 to the club. Well, I'm glad you let me know that. <laughs> hey, you are listening. How about that? <laughs> nope, it's still 100 unless you really want to push it upward. Well, I'm sure Jim Grant will take whatever you send him. 
You know what? I'll go ahead and send you my check and I'll double it. I'll do 200 See, look at that, how easy that was. $200. Thank you, Ginger. So that, that project continues on. Uh, looks like, like Rick said last week, we've got sponsors all the way out until next, next May. So if you're interested in sponsoring a month, just let myself or Rick Morris know and we'll get you on the list. Uh, Faith, you want to talk about our volunteering opportunities with the Women for Change Surfing in the Summer project? Uh, they are still uh, serving meals until the end of the month. I did drop off um, some drinks and snacks on Monday. So we're, we're down. So if any other Rotarians have dropped any items off, uh, kind of let me know so I can have an idea of how many have been participating in that. But um, they're still moving, moving along. And they, have, they have been excited about how many have been participating and they're, they're, they're reaching a lot of people. So it's a good project. Ginger, do you have a question with that? I just want to let Faith know that um, I did drop some things off too um, on, I think it was last, yeah, it was last Wednesday, right after you mentioned that. So uh, I went by and there were some people that donated some money. So I got about $200 worth of stuff and dropped it off there too. Awesome. Thank you, Ginger. Welcome. So if you are participating as a volunteer for this project, please track your hours and turn them in to me. It's one of those things as, as a, a Rotary secretary that we track. So I, I would love to see what kind of volunteer hours we actually produce in a year. So if you can remember to track those and email me at any given time, I, I'd greatly appreciate that. Uh, another one is uh, one of the other 100 Little Things projects that we're trying to get done this year is, uh, is through the American Red Cross and blood donations. Uh, I wanted to let everybody know that, that Egyptian Electric here in Murfreesboro has got a blood drive set up for Thursday, August 13th. Uh, if you'd like to, to volunteer to, to help or would you like to donate blood? The hours are between 11 a.m. And, and 4 p.m. On, on Thursday, August 13th. So that, that one, we'll, we'll drop a couple reminders between now and then. Uh, there are other sites closer to Carbondale. If you need any information on, on Red Cross locations, please let me know. Uh, a couple things from the district. Uh, we mentioned a couple months back that the district is doing training. It's all online, it's all free. Uh, the link that's on the screen is RI Zone 3031. That screen looks like this. You can come into the screen. You can sign up for any of these classes. The classes are there. Uh, any of the classes that are complete, like the, the diversity training that happened on July 11th, all of you can watch the PowerPoint. You can you can. Download it and watch it at your leisure. You can read the handouts. Last week there was Rotary Foundation training. This coming Saturday is how to engage new members. Uh, on August 1st is the, the completion of foundation training. And then August 8th is uh, High Impact Club. So those events are free to all Rotarians. And all you have to do is click on the link in the PowerPoint that I'm going to send to you. And it'll take you right out to the website if you're interested. Uh, also, the district is setting up some virtual summit training for October. That is uh, still to be determined what's going to be in it, but the save the date is October 10th. So if you're interested in that, that, that training, uh, mark your calendar. Another thing the district is moving toward is the innovative club concept. Uh, if you received your Rotarian magazine this month, on page 27, there's an article entitled Clubs Made to Order. Uh, one of the things that the district is doing is, you know, traditional clubs have been here and been a part of Rotary since the beginning, but traditional clubs don't fit every Rotarian. Uh, so there are club models that have been out there for a while from an e-club to a passport club, uh, hybrid type clubs. Uh, so the district is examining what ways can we help grow Rotary because uh, some things that you may not know since 
we started sheltering in place in March. There are clubs inside District 6510 that have not met at all, period, zero. While there are clubs like Carbondale's club that we've, we've continued to find a way to make a difference in our community and we're meeting in a, in a digital format. So uh, there is an opportunity to grow Rotary. And with the photos that you see on the screen, there is one that's called a cause club. Uh, what the District 6510 is working with districts along the Mississippi River from, from Minnesota to Louisiana to find like-minded individuals that care about the, the conservation efforts around the Mississippi River. So if you've been on Facebook, the group is called the Mississippi Runs Through Us, U.S. Uh, they've got about 20, 25 people that are interested in actually forming a cause club. They're going to be all they're going to be multi-state they'll meet online they'll be able to pop in and out of clubs everywhere and they'll be full-fledged rotarians uh, another type of club they're looking at forming is an alumni club um, an example could be alumni of siu they're scattered all around the world we could put them into uh, a, a club we could hybrid them into the rotary club of carbondale uh, so one of the things that was done is I was made chair of that committee, so I'll keep you up to date as we start working our way through how that's going to look. So any questions on that? Seeing none. Rotary International, one of the things that we talked about earlier was that I said I'd come circle back around to, to the eradication of polio. Uh, the video helps remind us that we are just this close. Uh, COVID kind of put a, a, a hamper on things. Last year, we were down to 64 cases worldwide. We're up to 84 as July 13. Uh, so that is probably the bad news. The good news is, is Nigeria is now three years in a row COVID, I mean, polio free. So we're waiting on certification that the entire continent of Africa is polio free. A uh, couple things to bear in mind is that when you donate money to the Polio Plus program, whether you do it through your dues collected by Jim Grant or you do it through uh, Rotary International automatically, say from a credit card, uh, there's only two organizations larger than Rotary International that give more money than Rotarians, one being the United States government and another one being the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now on the screen, you see the Rotary $100 million challenge. Uh, Rotary goal every year is to collect $50 million from Rotarians. If they can get to $50 million, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation matches that dollar for dollar. So if we get to $50 million, they, they give us $50 million. And we've done that successfully now again for the 2019-2020 year. So how do, we, how do we move forward with the fight against polio? I, I think we need to talk about it and we need to continue to raise money. Because it's going to be a challenge during these times to get into the countries where we need to be to assist, but we can continue the effort by, by donating money. So that is from the district. The, the last thing from Rotary International, if you watch the conference and you, and you follow the six areas of focus of Rotary, you'll see the, the symbol on the screen actually changed. Uh, there's actually seven areas of focus of Rotary now. Introduced this calendar year is the one that you see in the center. It's support for the environment. Uh, so that is another area of focus. If clubs that are interested in doing environmental projects in our community starting next Rotary year can apply for a district grant. So something to think about in our future is if we want to do an environmental project for the Carbondale area, it will be funded through a district grant. So. That's an exciting change that uh, kind of caught everybody by surprise that they kept, a, they kept that one pretty well secret. So, and now I'm going to, it's time for your good news. Does anybody have any good news to share? If, if you'd like to unmute yourself and share good news, I think that'd be great. Hi, Shane, it's Cindy again. I just wanted to say that Jerry and I were very lucky that we were able to go to our cabin in Maine and we largely sheltered in place there for a couple of weeks, but it was a great break for me, much needed. And we're safely back in Carbondale and glad to be back at Rotary again. Well, welcome back. 
Hi, Shane and everyone. Uh, I'm uh, happy to report that I, be I became a uh, grandfather for the uh, fifth time on yesterday. My daughter gave birth to a uh, six pound Gianna Ryan at 5.50 p.m. and uh, she's a healthy little girl. That's my very good news. I saw Congratulations. Courtney. I saw Courtney Sunday. She was <laughs> looking like about ready to drop. So that's, <laughs> that is good. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything they'd like to share? If not, uh, our temporary Sergeant at Arms, Gail White, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, I just put into the chat box my email and cell phone number. I'm sure that more of you have done good things this past week that, you, that you're not speaking up and uh, you know making us aware of. So I, I am continuing to keep a list uh, to give to Will Travelstead when he's able to resume his duties uh, of good deeds that you all have continued to do. I, I've added Ginger um, and Rick for things that I'm aware of this past week and then uh, Faith and Pam and Ella and um, uh, Jim and uh, Jerry and <laughs> most everybody I think I have on the list, but there are a few that I don't. So please let me know if you have things and I'll get uh, your name on the uh, get out of jail uh, pass list. And I'll ask for your help when I'm sure that uh, Will will take out retribution against me for doing this when he's back in, in the saddle doing his duties. So uh, please come to my aid when it's when that time comes. Camera's off. Yeah. How much do you think that's going to cost us? Probably about what you asked Ginger to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was afraid the answer was going to be. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to share before we move on to our guest speaker today? Bart, I'll let you introduce yourself, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Shane. Uh, I want to thank everybody for inviting me today uh, to speak to you all. Uh, uh, I'm Bart Hagston. I'm the administrator at Jackson County Health Department. Uh, that's a role I've had for a little over a year now. Uh, I've been here for 21 years. Uh, and so uh, I was asked to speak about uh, the health department and our response to COVID-19 and uh, talk about its uh, impact on the community and those types of things. And so uh, I really just uh, jotted down some some notes and I'll just talk and uh, certainly at the end I'm um, willing to field all sorts of questions and try and try and answer anything uh, that you're wondering about. I know there's lots of questions out there and uh, we're, we're working hard to try and put together uh, guidance for the public. Uh, we post a lot of that uh, on our website. So if you haven't been on there, that's uh, jchdonline.org. And so we're continually posting new guidance uh, there. So um, as of yesterday, we are up to a total of 428 cases to date, uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Jackson County. Uh, we've had unfortunately 19 deaths related to, to COVID. Uh, we have had 338 people that we have released from isolation, so they have uh, uh, weathered the disease and, and recovered for the most part. Uh, and as of yesterday, we had 71 active cases. So that's a pretty high load for us. Uh, we like to keep the, the number of active cases down below uh, 30. That's a more manageable number for us. Um, and so uh, so 71 is, is a pretty high amount. Um, and so we've been working since, uh, well, some of us have really been working on this issue since the, the beginning of February, uh, the middle of March, we stood up our response structure here at the health department and basically pulled um, two thirds of our employees off of their regular work to work on COVID and that's fluctuated up and down since that time uh, as the workload has has uh, waxed and waned. And so uh, we've uh, 
been working with all sorts of organizations, businesses, schools, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. Um, uh, and you know, while we're talking about cases, you may have seen some of the uh, the media this week uh, in relation to our cases in Jackson County. At this point, 57% of our cases uh, in Jackson County in July uh, are from individuals in their teens and 20s. So that is a concern for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that's a particular demographic we need to be uh, reaching uh, with the message. And uh, so uh, probably a difficult demographic for us to work with on, on the matter just because young people are social in nature. Uh, and they want to hang out with their friends and do all of those normal things, uh, combined with the fact that most young people uh, don't, uh, if they get COVID, they, they're able to weather it very well. They don't uh, get a lot of symptoms, a lot of complications uh, like other individuals, and so uh, they may not take it as seriously. Uh, but that's not to say that certainly all young people don't take it seriously. I don't want to paint uh, with too broad of a brush there, but uh, uh, you know, those are just um, some of the things why we're thinking that young people are, are uh, a larger percentage of our cases right now, uh, combined with the fact that Illinois is in phase four of the Restore Illinois plan, which uh, has allowed uh, restaurants to reopen for indoor dining, um, more people at restaurants and bars, uh, more people have returned to work. And so obviously that's going to create more opportunities for exposure and transmission of the disease. Uh, so that's why it's important for people to follow all of the precautions that public health puts out there regarding uh, wearing of uh, face masks or face coverings, maintaining social distance, uh, limiting the size of gatherings, uh, especially indoors, uh, washing your hands and and staying home if you're sick. So uh, making sure that people aren't getting out um, if they develop any symptoms, which could be COVID. Uh, and that's part of the problem also with COVID in that there are so many different symptoms that people can display or they can be symptomatic, asymptomatic, not showing symptoms as well. And so it, it complicates matters when the symptoms for COVID mimic so many other things, the flu, other respiratory diseases, the common cold, uh, and um, so uh, seasonal allergies. Uh, so people have all of these things, they've experienced them before, and they think uh, that's what they default to thinking that they have when they come up with uh, symptoms. Um, so mild symptoms and people that are uh, asymptomatic are typically what are driving transmission because they don't think they're sick and they're getting out of the house. People that are very sick stay home. They don't feel well, they don't, they don't typically go places. And so, uh, so that's unfortunately how the disease gets spread a lot of times is people are venturing out when they have very few symptoms or, or don't have any at all. And so uh, that's why it's important that people be educated about what the symptoms are uh, and, and, and um, you can go right to the CDC's website. If you type into Google CDC and symptoms, it'll automatically know you're talking about COVID and take you right to them. So they're very easy to find. Uh, and then hopefully all of you, um, if you're um, uh, representing a, a business or a, an organization where people are coming in and out of that location that you have implemented some procedures to protect your uh, employees and your customers or clients and so that can include screening them for any symptoms taking temperatures and then implementing those same things I talked about before about masks social distancing things like that uh, and we're certainly available here at the health department to help answer any questions um, we have even been out on site to several uh, businesses and government offices to help them look at their setups and try and help determine um, if, if the way they have things set up um, are protective of, of the health of their staff and, and customers. And so uh, that's something we can do for uh, many of you as well. Um, just give us a call. Um, many of you have heard about uh, contact tracing. Uh, and so that is something we've been doing since the start of this response. And so contact tracing is basically 
uh, once we inform someone that they are positive for COVID, then we are going through a lengthy questionnaire with them, asking them about people they've been around lately and places they've been. And that helps us develop a list of uh, individuals that we're going to call and ask them about the, those interactions and the potential risk levels. So basically what we're doing is through these conversations, assessing risk uh, uh, to other people. And then if the risk uh, of them contracting it is, is determined to be uh, more than uh, really low, then we place individuals on home quarantine. Uh, and so that uh, lasts for 14 days from their last contact with a positive. Um, and we encourage people to get tested if they become symptomatic. Usually when we're asking people to get tested, uh, we recommend they wait about five days from their last contact with the positive. Uh, if you get tested too early, you may get a false negative, uh, meaning your body has not had a full chance to, um, uh, to develop a response to the disease, uh, and so it may not show up on the test results. So waiting five days is usually our recommendation. Um, and so then through that contact tracing process, we're uh, kind of developing a web of people uh, that each individual that's positive has come into contact with. Early on in the response, when people were staying at home, for every positive we would call, we might have three or four other people that they had interacted with, um, very, very minimal. Now we're seeing for every positive case that uh, there might be 10, 20 or more people that they have uh, been in close contact with and that we then assess for placing on quarantine. So you may have an individual who goes out to dinner with friends, then goes to a bar or to, or to a party. And so you have uh, many more potential um, interactions and exposures. And so that has created a, a more complex um, a job for us here at Public Health. Uh, and so uh, we certainly recognize that people want to have some semblance of a normal life and get out and that businesses need to be open uh, and, and doing what they do and that, um, that those are important. But we also want people to remember to uh, exercise caution, limit those interactions when possible, practice all of those uh, public health precautions that I already uh, mentioned previously. So, um, and then uh, through the process of contact tracing, then that's helping to uh, isolate those that are on, that are sick. So we isolate people that have COVID, we quarantine people that had potential exposure but aren't sick yet. And so you'll hear those two terms uh, some people will use them interchangeably, but that's basically how it works. Isolate the sick, quarantine the well or not sick yet. Uh, and then we're working, uh, as people work through their isolation and quarantine periods, our staff are checking in on them uh, frequently, uh, more frequently if they are ill, uh, less frequently if they're not, and assessing their health so that we can then release them at some point from their isolation or quarantine. So isolation is typically a 10 day period once you're sick. Um, the last uh, 24 hours you have to be fever free. So if you get to day 10 and you still have a fever, we'll keep you on isolation until you become fever free. Uh, and uh, quarantine is 14 days from your last contact with a positive, which is which sounds straightforward until you maybe reside with a positive individual. So your 14 days do not start until they get released from isolation. So if their isolation is 10 days, that's when the 14 days start is at the end of that. So it can become very lengthy, especially if the person that's being isolated uh, remains sick for a while and does not get released at the 10 day mark. So uh, I know those that's all very confusing to people. We try and uh, make it as easy as possible to understand. Uh, we've got some graphics and things that we link to on our website to help people kind of get their mind around that. Um, and uh, so there's lots of guidance out there from the CDC, the State Health Department, we have linked on our website. Uh, you also, I'm sure, are aware of the Restore Illinois plan that I referenced earlier. And so that is the 
the state of Illinois plan, uh, phase four. Uh, we will probably be in phase four for quite some time. Uh, we cannot reach phase five until uh, till vaccines or effective treatments are available. Um, and it's gonna be a while before that all happens. So um, best case scenario, I would see some vaccines um, being uh, through their trials by the end of the year and then production has to ramp up and then public health would be involved in doing mass vaccination clinics out in the community to get this vaccine out there. Uh, and that might mean rolling it out in phases to the most vulnerable people first uh, and to, to those less vulnerable later on as production on the vaccine or vaccines ramps up. We'll probably have various vaccines from different manufacturers that need to be made available. Um, and some of the vaccines may require more than one dose. Uh, so you might have to get two doses separated by 30 or 60 days. And so all of that is to be determined. Uh, that'll all add more to public uh, confusion and we'll try and help navigate those waters and make it more clear for people. Um, and so that's, uh, those are that we're trying to think ahead and think about the things we're going to be doing two months from now, six months from now, beyond that. So um, the, you may have also seen last week that the governor introduced the Illinois COVID mitigation plan, uh, the resurgence plan, he called it. And so that further broke the state down into regions. So we went from the four uh, regions um, previously to the 11 regions. So it kind of broke off Southern Illinois from the Metro East. And they provided some other metrics to be looking at um, and so, uh, so those are all on the Illinois Department of Public Health website, uh, and they laid out um, criteria for moving us back, um, not necessarily full phases, not all the way to uh, phase three, but basically rolling back certain activities like indoor dining and bars and things like that. Uh, so, so um, you know, I have my doubts that uh, the state would move us back fully, uh, full phases, although that could happen. But I certainly could see situations where if we don't meet the metrics that were laid out last week, they could move us back this partial phase and uh, certain activities could be curtailed again. So, and we don't want that to happen, um, uh, you know, uh, as much as none of you want that to happen. Um, so, uh, um, I mentioned working with businesses and schools. Uh, you know, I'm sure several of you have seen that some businesses uh, in Jackson County have been impacted by COVID um, through employees that have been positive and or patrons that come through that are uh, turn out to be positive later. Uh, and so we're certainly working with those uh, businesses. Um, uh, when we notify someone that they're positive for COVID, we um, we inform them that we're going to be talking to their employer so they're aware of that um, and that we are then contacting that employer and, and working through the issues trying to determine who we might consider to be a close contact of that positive case. And so a close contact is generally defined as uh, somebody who has been within six feet of a positive for 15 minutes or more. And typically close contacts are the ones we're going to place on, on home quarantine. Uh, if you worked in a facility with somebody, but uh, they work in the kitchen and you work out front and you never really were within six feet for more than 15 minutes, then we would not consider you a close contact. So, so that's what we're doing when we're talking with business owners and managers is trying right. to assess that level of risk uh, and who we are going to then need to place on quarantine and who we are not. Those that we are not, then we would, the, we would have the business owner or manager basically contact them, let them know there's been a positive. We're not deeming them a close contact, but they need to uh, monitor themselves for symptoms and to get tested uh, if they do become symptomatic and of course to stay home if they're symptomatic. So, uh, so those are conversations we're having with businesses. We're trying to put together some uh, some better guidance uh, in a written form for businesses to help help walk you through that and not do this just on a case-by-case -case basis every time this happens. So that's something we're actively working on. Um, and, and so 
Uh, we want to, uh, you know, we want businesses to thrive, but we also want to stop the transmission of this disease. And so that requires a cooperative working relationship between the health department and, and businesses to do that. Um, and also we can work with businesses on messaging um, in those situations. So our advice to businesses is always to be forthcoming. Um, and I think people have seen from when they have been transparent um, in their actions, uh, uh, they've received mostly positive comments. Of course, you're always gonna have people who look to the negative side and take pot shots, uh, but uh, the overwhelming majority of people will um, praise businesses for being open and honest about um, these situations and will support them um, um, if, uh, if they close they'll they'll come back um, and so uh, that's that's the guidance we're giving businesses um, they're certainly free to do um, whatever route they choose uh, typically we are not uh, or have not at this point been disclosing the names of, of businesses um, that is an option that we might consider, um, especially if it's a, um, you know, if it's an office setting where we can really do contact tracing with the people in that office, that's fine. In, in other settings like a restaurant, uh, then it becomes harder to do contact tracing. So, um, so you know, we're, we're looking at all options that are out there to be able to uh, effectively track down uh, people who've been exposed to this disease and keep them at home. Um, uh, the, the, this, the article in the Southern this week where I was quoted was a little misleading in that um, we, it, it talked about avenues, we, legal avenues we might take um, with businesses that don't um, effectively uh, address COVID. And really those, what I was referencing were businesses that refuse to cooperate with us uh, and and will not take action to prevent the spread of disease to to their other employees. So that's that's what I was referring to. Uh, really, our experience thus far has been almost every business that we've that we've dealt with has been very cooperative uh, and wants to address this uh, as much as we do. And so uh, that's that's kind of what's been going on um, here, health department wise. I mentioned schools earlier, working with those. We've been working with school administrators in, in Jackson County about developing their plans and procedures uh, for the fall. Um, they are in a very tough spot uh, and um, uh, the guidance from the state has been changing and less than clear and sometimes not there. And so uh, that complicates matters for them. And so uh, I don't envy uh, uh, their work that they have uh, on their plate. Um, but we are, we are working with them to try and do that as best uh, as we can and as best as they can. So um, uh, I guess I'll open it up to questions. The other thing I did want to plug, you plugged the, um, the blood drive earlier um, at Egyptian uh, Electric. So we also have a blood drive here at the health department on August 6th uh, in our rear building from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, so we would encourage uh, the public to come out for that as well. Um, and uh, thought I'd throw that plug in there, it seemed timely. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. I can try and look at the chat box or take verbal questions as well, however you normally do that, Shane. Does anybody have any questions? I'll start while, while people are thinking. You mentioned uh, 71 active cases and, and 30 was a goal. What kind of stretch on resources does nearly double of your goal put on the on the county? Well, you know, right now we have uh, eight people that are doing contact tracing, um, and certainly that um, that just means they're working long hours uh, and doing a lot of work. We have um, we're hiring fourteen people to bring on board. We're receiving a grant, it's federal dollars that are coming through the state health department. And so we're, those are specifically aimed at uh, improving contact tracing at the local level, as well as uh, expanding local testing capacity. Uh, and so we're working with SIH and SIU on that, uh, the testing end of it. Um, but we'll be bringing on people. The first one started uh, this week. We'll have some more coming on in the next two weeks. Uh, and that'll really, allow us to let the people who've been doing this work to 
mostly return to their previous jobs uh, that they do here at the health department and bring on this new crew and have to train them up um, so that they'll really be a full-time COVID crew working uh, seven days a week um, to, to address this issue. Great, thank you. Any, Faith, go ahead and unmute yourself. For um, the, the antibody testing and et cetera that we've heard about, how, how often is that being done and you know, who can get it? Is, has it been effective? So from the local health department side, we have not been involved with antibody testing efforts uh, thus far. Uh, from our perspective, antibody testing, the science is still not um, where it needs to be. Uh, and uh, I know some private providers have been offering antibody testing uh, in the community. Um, I don't know much about those, those efforts. I think once the, uh, you know, the, there's lots of antibody tests out there. Um, uh, most of them do not have emergency use authorizations from the FDA, so I would not um, utilize those. Uh, ones that do have EUAs um, I, would probably be more effective, but certainly the results um, have, have varied, and I think they're working to improve those all the time, but uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not sold on, on antibody testing results at this point. Gail White. Uh, Bart, I heard something on the news this morning about home test kits. Um, can you tell us anything about how close we might be to having those available? Yeah, I've been hearing a little more about those as well. Um, and I, I, those are going through that same emergency use authorization process through the FDA that the antibody tests do. Uh, and so, um, I'm uncertain if we're going to see those hit the market this month or within uh, three or four more months. So I'm not exactly sure. I would say within the next few months, certainly we'll, we'll have some options available. And most of those will probably have some kind of, um, you know, tutorial that, that you can go through, like an online video that'll kind of talk you through things. Most of them will be a saliva test, so they won't be that difficult to to do. It's not like you're going to be uh, doing the, the nasal swab um, on most of them. And so, uh, so it should be pretty simple. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the saliva test technology is coming around the University of Illinois. That's what they're doing uh, with all of their staff and students um, is a saliva test. And I think we'll probably be moving more to saliva tests um, all across the board in the next several months because it is easier, it is cheaper. Um, and it will, and by making it cheaper, then we'll enable more tests to be done uh, nationwide. Ella Lacey, did you have a question? Yeah, Bart, um, my mouth doesn't move in, move in this, but I'm here. Uh, <laughs> as you may know, I've worked in the polio campaign a lot in, internationally, and so I wonder if you know anything about whether they're talking about a live vaccine such as the oral polio vaccine is, or are they only talking about a kill vaccine as the original salt vaccine is? Do you know if they're talking about both of them or either one? Yeah, so there, there, are, dozen, there are dozens of vaccines that are, um, are in process. And so different manufacturers are taking different approaches to how they're uh, making those vaccines. Uh, uh, the ones I think that are most promising that I've seen are, are uh, not a live virus. Um, um, so I'm, I'm uncertain if any of them contain a, a, a live virus or not. Most of the ones I've been reading about, at least the ones that are kind of that everybody's touting as being the most promising are, are a dead virus. Okay, thank you. Bert Gossman, you're next. Um, yes, I, have, we'll do share I actually had a two-part question. One is, for the asymptomatic cases, are those being found in certain demographics or like are the younger people more likely to have the asymptomatic or is it just across the board? 
And then my last question, um, what was that? No, go ahead and answer the first one and I'll think about my last one, I'm sorry. Okay, good, because I can only handle one at a time. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, Locally, I'm not sure what our data shows. I think nationally from the things I've read that, um, you know, more, uh, more young people are certainly asymptomatic. Um, you know, we're talking uh, kids under, under 18. Um, but also interestingly, um, uh, a lot of the elderly population uh, also don't show uh, symptoms as well. So, um, uh, people in their 70s and 80s, uh, they don't, uh, if they have a fever, uh, you know, they typically don't have high fevers and things like that. So they tend to hide uh, a lot of these symptoms uh, that people that are um, kind of, you know, 20 to 60 might show. So, so I think it's kind of at both ends of the spectrum that the young and the old maybe don't show uh, symptoms as much. And so I'm ready for the second part now. All right, sorry. Um, have you had anybody come in and say, hey, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I've wore a mask. I've only been to the grocery store. You know, I've done all these precautions. Have you had many cases of those who people really have tried their best to, to not get it? A few, yes. Um, uh, we've had a few people that really you know, can detail for us uh, how seriously they have taken the virus and all the precautions they have taken and how they've hardly been out of the house uh, and yet somehow have still contracted it. And so, uh, and, and that we haven't been able to track down. And so maybe it was um, uh, a home health care worker that came in that they weren't recalling um, or it was that one trip out that they made. Um, uh, so sometimes through the contact tracing, we, we don't end up figuring out how they got it. Um, uh, that, that, that happens uh, frequently. Um, and so some of that is because they, they had a brief interaction that, that they're not recalling or, um, uh, you know, it's, you know, uh, there's also the potential for picking it up from a surface and then rubbing your eyes or your face. I know the science has uh, kind of downplayed that um, in the last couple months, but it's still certainly a possibility. So there's, there's still a lot we don't know. Um, this is a, a novel virus, a new virus, and so we're not exactly sure on all of these things at this point. And that, that also leads to um, some of the issues that we have, right, of, of people not necessarily uh, mm -hmm. believing in coronavirus in the novel coronavirus or or all of this that's taking place and that you know they want um, they think that the science should be settled here within uh, six eight months of something coming around and that's just not the way it works thank you yes I was just Sharon did you have a question yes thank you I was just wondering um, last week we were were similar to Cindy, we were with family at a cabin in the Smokies. We were very careful. Um, but what if I started showing symptoms? What do I call my doctor for a test? Can I just drive up someplace? I, you know, I, I'm really like every time I sneeze or something, I'm like freaking out. So, um, well, don't freak out. You know me, I freak out <laughs> quite frequently. So. Um, so yeah, certainly if, um, if you, uh, return from travel somewhere or you maybe, uh, had a potential exposure, certainly monitoring yourself for symptoms is, is, uh, just every day a good thing, but especially if you had, did some travel, um, and if you do pick up some symptoms, then, then you can get tested. Uh, calling your, your physician is certainly the best first step. Uh, but people can also directly call the SIH COVID hotline or Shawnee Health Service. Uh, they're both doing testing in Jackson County. Um, so they're drive-through tests, but you have to have an appointment. Uh, so, so doing that and then, um, you know, they can uh, get you in, get you tested rather quickly. The turnaround times on the tests um, are um, definitely an issue. Um, on good days, we can get turnaround time on tests in two days. Uh, on the heavy times, 
uh, we've seen five or six days, which is uh, a big problem. Um, so, um, so you know that uh, people don't mind staying at home waiting on their test results for a couple of days, but then you stretch it out to almost a week, and people get antsy and want to get out. So, uh, so that's that's what we're looking at there. I think through the uh, I mentioned the the grant money we're getting to try and expand some local testing capacity. Uh, that 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 will help. We'll be able to uh, help fund some equipment at SIH, some testing equipment that might help um, speed things up, the turnaround time. So we'll uh, we'll have to see how that impacts the the local situation. Mark, um, asymptomatic cases. How do we know they even have the disease, and uh, if they don't show any symptoms, and what evidence is there that they? can transmit it if they show no symptoms, no fever? Good question. Um, so the asymptomatic folks, they might get tested either because they, um, they work in healthcare and they're being tested on a regular basis or because they uh, maybe were somebody we've quarantined. They were a potential close contact to another known positive. And so those would be the reasons why an asymptomatic person would be getting uh, tested in the first place. Um, the, the chances of a false positive are very, very low. Um, chances of a false negative are much higher. So um, that's something that people don't talk about a lot, but uh, uh, that does happen. Um, but the chances of somebody showing up as positive that doesn't have COVID are, 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 are very low. Um, and so that's how we find out asymptomatic people have have the disease in general. And they can spread it. Oh, yeah, that's the other part. Um, and so asymptomatic people uh, can spread it. Um, it's unknown, I guess, how much. And so certainly the, the studies up to this point have shown that symptomatic people, especially if you have severe symptoms, then they generally have a higher viral load within their system. And so they are more able to transmit the disease to people. Um, and so I think uh, there's not a, uh, we don't fully know what level of asymptomatic transmission um, is, is occurring. Uh, I know there's been controversy over that. I think the World Health Organization at one point, an official had said that that was rare and then she turned around the next day and corrected herself. And so uh, those, those mixed messages um, from, WHO or CDC or anybody have, have really um, done a disservice to to how we've approached this disease and caused a lot of confusion. Um, and it, it shouldn't be this hard. Um, and so uh, I don't blame people for, for throwing their hands up and saying, what's what's the real deal? Because they're, they're tired of, of having to get get mixed messages. So that, that was a very good question. Thank you. May I ask a question? Shoot. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't know if anybody recognized me. Um, is there any enforcement being done in businesses of particularly high risk businesses like restaurants if, if, if staff aren't wearing masks? I've heard a few reports of a restaurant here in Carbondale where the, the servers and even the cooks weren't wearing masks. and those people won't go back, but I really feel like they should be called out for that, particularly a restaurant. So, Yeah, that, is, um, that has been uh, probably our number one question and, and the bane of our existence here in the last uh, two or three months. Um, we don't really have good tools in place to enforce face masks, unfortunately. Um, we you know, it's guidance from the state. Um, they are not requirements. Um, and so that has really hamstrung us um, from approaching it from a hard enforcement side. Uh, we certainly have, we're taking complaints, we're calling businesses um, multiple times if needed, trying to get them to implement uh, this guidance. Uh, but uh, we don't really have good uh, enforcement tools in place to be able to do that, unfortunately. Oops. Um, so, so that's kind of where we're at 
on that. I think having said that, we're, we're currently exploring some things um, with our food code and with the Illinois Communicable Disease Code uh, and looking at them uh, more closely to see what, um, what leverage they might might offer us, especially in some place that um, has uh, blatantly not followed guidance and has refused to really move on the issue. So we're, we're looking at that with our state's attorney's office um, that we're, we're not close to being able to take some action yet. Thank you. Um, Any other questions? Our Christine McGuire. Christine McGuire here. Um, have there been any cases in Jackson County or Southern Illinois reinfections? That, that's another good question. And so we have had probably four or five people in Jackson County um, that we have released from isolation, meaning they had went through their 10 day period. Um, they did, had no symptoms, no fevers. They met all the criteria. And then four weeks, six weeks down the road, they get um, ill, more ill than they were the first time and end up in the hospital. And so those have been the outliers. Um, and so we're not, we're not exactly sure if those are reinfections or is the virus somehow lingering within their system. Um, all of these people had underlying health conditions, which um, you know, may have complicated factors there. Uh, so there's still a lot of, a lot we don't know there. Um, the, the state has, the CDC has now came out and told us that uh, basically um, uh, anybody that tests positive, um, again, up through 90 days past their first positive, we're not counting them as a new infection. Um, so, um, so typically people can have antibodies in their system um, for two to three months. Uh, and then beyond that, the studies thus far have shown beyond that people aren't showing antibodies. Um, and so anything that came after that would be considered a, a reinfection. Um, and they're starting to, now that they've made that determination, they're starting to track that more and try and look for those things that they would term to be reinfection. So I think we'll see some, some uh, collection of that data um, that, that maybe hasn't been um, collected in that manner thus far. A quick question, I think. Uh, Bart, not, I don't want you to identify any particular school, but is there a school protocol going on in Jackson County or the state of Illinois about testing for staff, uh, teachers, other staff, students, testing once students are going to school in person? Um, there has been a little bit put out there. I, I, I was told uh, yesterday that um, the State Health Department and State Board of Education are supposed to have out some updated guidance to schools by the end of this week. And I believe it should address that particular issue um, as well as many others. Um, so I think uh, we'll to be determined. Okay, thank you. Bart, thank you for your time today. Uh, got grilled pretty hard there, so we, we greatly appreciate you spending time with us today. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate the invitation. Lots of uh, familiar faces on there. I did want to give a shout out to uh, Pam Umloff Brown is on the phone. She's one of our best volunteers here at the health department. She's been working with us on COVID, so thanks, Pam. So next, next week, uh, what's coming up next week is we have club assembly next week. Uh, on August 5th, uh, our guest speaker will be Carmelita from the, the Carbondale Warming Center. And then the Rotary Youth Exchange will be the week after that. So we have some exciting speakers coming up. Uh, don't forget uh, to take care of yourselves and be healthy. And I'll ask that Carl Flowers lead us in the four-way test. 
Let me make sure that I'm here. Uh, would you all please uh, join me in the other rotary four-way tests of things that we think, say, and do? First, is it is the it truth? True? Second, is, is it, it fair, fair to all, all concerned? Concern? Third, well, will it build will the will and better friendships? friendships? And four, will it be beneficial, be beneficial to all concerned? All concerned. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Mark.